right, so welcome to episode six of A Screw Loose. This is our second special technician edition, and we are thrilled to be here. Um, so we have a ton of questions. We have so many questions. It's fabulous. Um, in fact, we have enough for like three more tech episodes, I think. Um, but we'll, we'll do our best to get through a bunch of them tonight. Um, so uh, we are here from all across the North American continent. We've got Kim Durins from Canada. We've got Adam Petrie from Georgia. And we've got Rachel Simon from Pennsylvania. And myself, Sarah Stockton from Connecticut. And I realize that I say Canada like it's a state, you know, like it's like... <laughs> 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 So, from Victoria, British Columbia. <laughs> Anywho, um, so we have a couple of disclaimers. Well, we have to be precise, uh, several disclaimers. Um, one is, oh, I just covered it on my page. One is that our opinions are our own and not those of anyone who we are affiliated with or you perceive us to be affiliated with. Um, Adam, <coughs> apron. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> we have different views. that's okay that's what makes this this is not a paid advertisement like like nascar yeah. <laughs> it would be funny if we came in with like shirts that were like <laughs> you could buy my shoulder that would be awesome okay Actually, i'm sorry i take five <laughs> um, we might change our minds on any advice that we give uh, as soon as the end of this episode and uh, use this information at your own risk. So uh, this week we have some fabulous questions um, and we just want to remind you guys one more time that uh, we have our Patreon page. It's up and running. We're planning on doing our first technician um, group chat next month so it probably first half of september we're going to plan that so if you sign up at our patreon at the ten dollar level that gets you the chance to talk with us live ask us your questions it's a private format so only people who are signed up at that level get to take part so you can ask us your deep scary questions <laughs> those episodes will not be posted for the public so please come in and join us um uh and it's gonna be great. So if you sign up by the 1st of September, like by August 31st at like 11.59 p.m. in, I think, Pacific time, <laughs> you'll be able to join us for September because um, we, we, we bill at the beginning of the next month. So like if you sign up now, you're not gonna get charged for August. So don't worry about that. Sign up now, you'll be ready to go for September. Um, awesome. I guess what I want to say about that. Should we dive in? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I lost your screws. Oh, there's our screws. So the format of this um, <laughs> is I have four loose screws. I will toss them down upon the table next to me. The order in which they fall is the order in which you will hear from us. Uh, we each have 30 seconds to answer the question. After that, we have about two minutes and 30 seconds to kind of free for all and comment on that question and uh, we may run longer than that, but we try not to, so we can keep things moving. So here we go. Our first question comes from Don, and Don asks the very excellent question, why can't I get an open hole flute to hold air the same way that I can a student flute? So our order for this is going to be uh, Kim, Rachel, Adam, and then myself. I'm so glad you're first, Kim. <laughs> Good work. All right. Okay, right. go for Set it. Timer. I, I, I you um, start. I'll, I'll catch up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the the question is between a student for a uh, closed hole flute and uh, open hole flute. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the big ones is the fitting of the grommet bushings in the chimney. It needs to be really tight. So if those are leaking, then that's going to be a huge um a huge problem. You're going to see big just discrepancies there. That's there's my thirty seconds. <laughs> cool. That was less than 30 <laughs> seconds, in fact. I, I, I aim to please. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, lo I forgot the order. Is it Rachel? I think I'm next. I think so. <laughs> Kim said what I was going to say. But, <laughs> but also, aside from the, the, the bushings themselves leaking, um, sometimes I find that, especially because there's so much variety in the, the ergonomics of different open hole flutes, that I have no shame in putting some plugs in, especially for the right hand, um, fourth finger and such, because to just make sure my fingers aren't leaking just because this isn't my personal flute. Um, do I have more seconds? You do. Oh, also, it helps. Sometimes you can kind of like 
encourage yourself to press even more lightly too. If you, if you like, just like use like the back of the key. You know, it's nice for a really delicate test sometimes. Awesome, Adam. Um, I also recommend using the plugs just because you can also get little leaks through your fingerprints. Even if you're covering the hole, you'll still lose a little bit just due to your fingerprint. And then also if you're drawing suction, that can lie to you because the skin will pull away from the underlying cushion material. So just make sure that you have a, an entire arsenal of, of techniques to kind of check if it's leaking. So that's all I got. Cool. Um, I would just add that if you are pretty darn sure that the pads are covering the way that you want them to and everything is still leaking, you can, um, you can get uh, uh, Teflon seals to put under the, the bushings um, that will help to, um, especially if you're using Delrin bushings, that'll help to, to block the air a little bit more. Um, it's also not unheard of to put a little bit of um, like wax and melt that down in mm. between the bushing and the, the mm -hmm. chimney. That's a good um, trick. Yeah, and that'll help it to hold air a little bit better. Um, but mostly you just want to make sure that your bushings are like perfectly round and the chimney is perfectly round and they fit really, really snugly with each other. Because if there's any like chips or dips or, you know, imperfections in that interface, then it, it's going to be leaking and you're not going to know why because you can't see it or feel it. Um, anybody want a free for all on that? Um, I just have two little things I remembered. If you just replaced the pad and you adjusted the protrusion of that key cup, it is also possible that that bushing will be bottoming out and not sealing against the pad skin itself. And then also I know that certain step up flutes for a while because I saw it on a few, I think, yeah, I've seen some that came out of Elkhart look for a while where to keep a good fit on the, on the open hole, they actually split the bushing yeah. and it was leaking mm -hmm. through the bushing. So sometimes you'll see that. So that's something to kind of look forward. To, and in that case, I would just recommend replacing them with like nylon or Delrin, um, ones that are going to kind of expand and squeeze onto the, the mm -hmm. chimney. Yep. Um, also, for people, oh, sorry, are we going to go? No, no, go. For anyone that uses a mag, um, you can help to turn if you're if you're just wondering if you have more leaks to chase or if your bushing's leaking. You can double check it with a leak isolator. This is the one from Jim Schmidt, and it has these O-rings and. The way that I like to use this with the mag, if I'm suspecting a bushing, is if you press if you press on any pad with this, you should be able to just you should be able to get it to zero. Even if you have to squeeze it, it'll still get to zero. If you're squeezing it like really hard and it does not, and you're at, sitting at like a half a point or one point, um, then it's almost certainly the um, the pad retainer. So. Yeah. The other way that I like to check is also with my mag is I use the the pad isolator. So this is just a little. Delrin oh, thing that yeah, comes yeah. with the with the set, and so what you can do. Oh, I just pulled all the pads out of this. I forget about loop. those. <laughs> but you can actually. I, I was yeah. hoping you were going to have yours. I was going to ask. Yeah, so you can actually just push this right onto the pad. It's something. I think there's one in the garbage here. I just pulled all the pads out of this loop because I'm repadding it. So you can actually check the pad itself. Um, and I usually just throw my thumb against the back and push. And if that doesn't go to zero, then you've got a bad pad. So it might not even be your, your bushing. And open hole pads, you know, they have the bigger holes. Sometimes they're more prone to the skin splitting, you know, whatever. Um, but you can also use this on the key itself, like over the grommet and, and check the grommet seal that way. So when the key is off the flute, just individually check it that way. Um, I, this is, I love this thing, it's great. And I then you have. Um, also, I just remembered one more thing, like you can use the rubber stoppers mm -hmm. instead of plugs. And you can also check each one by using a little tube. Yes. And you can put that mm -hmm. over the bottom and you can draw suction that way. So like this is a smaller one. I typically use a copper one, but I have so much stuff on my desk right now. I don't know where it went. Um, but those work really well. And then if you have a lathe, you can turn a lot of like custom sized tubing. So that way if you end up you know, having like an alto or a base and you're unsure if the washers are sealing. Yeah, I have that one that Kim's holding up. Yep. Um, <laughs> Do you guys want to keep that going on this or we're out of time technically? Yeah. But okay. Okay. <laughs> those, those are extra. Next. Okay. <laughs> well, cool. we will talk about this even more later. Yeah, so. and there's there's different That's ways you can tip, like Adam. size your stuff to make sure. Uh, so yeah, it's an endless topic. Well, Ma endless, many, but. many, many others. Okay. Good question, Don. Yes, thank you, Don. Yes. <laughs> All right, um, Bob asks us, uh, do you find that flute pad skins become more porous and leaky with age, even though the skin is not torn or damaged in any way? Uh, the order for this is going to be Adam? 
me, Kim, and then Rachel. Um, I personally think they do. Um, I once took a little tiny piece of tubing and took an old pad and I took the skin off of it and I glued it all the way around the tube and I put several layers of glue to make sure it's really tight. And I decided to see if I could pull suction on the tube and I could breathe straight through it. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I do think that over time they do become more porous. Cool. That's all I got. All right. So um, <laughs> I, I always check when I'm installing new pads, I use that little thing that I just showed you just to sh see if the pads are, are holding because even new ones sometimes you don't know how long they've been sitting around for like it's a really good idea to check them um they could be 10 years old by the time you get to it you know um uh but I also do check when people drop off a flute and the pads look old to me but you know they seem to be fine I'll still go through and check the whole flute with that individual pad thing because sometimes it's like it, it, the flute just doesn't sound good and yeah, you don't know why and then you find oh my god like none of these pads can zero out and they might look good, but they're not good. All right, next is who's next? I forgot, I lost. and they rolled. <laughs> I don't know when you guys go. <laughs> Ra Rachel, Rachel's gonna go. Okay, okay Rachel. <laughs> um, I, I'm just trying to think. I don't really have a whole lot to add to that, and um, that's a really cool test you did, Adam. That's so that's so revealing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's why we're generally recommending if if pads are, are ten or so more years old, you should really think about just repadding, even if it seems to to play great. It's um. First of all, they're usually not even very adjustable at that point anyways, because they become brittle and uh, wet and dried so many times. So yeah, I don't really have much to add. I, I agree, they do get porous over time. Okay, great, Kim. Um, yeah, I, like everybody else said, um, I often find, I see a lot of pads that are really, really old here, and um, they end up acting more like a sieve than they do a bowl is how I often explain it to people. Um, they have the microscopic lease uh, and they also tend to get really brittle. So they end up being, instead of being nice and flexible, they end up being um, almost like really old newspaper. So they get porous and really fragile. So then when you go to take them out or adjust them, um, they can just disintegrate on you. So it's something you want to work into your pricing is double check them before you start taking it apart because if they're going to disintegrate, you want to know before you sign up for a specific job. True. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. They look oh, fine. They look fine. Oh, crap. They're not that bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> welcome to my, well, welcome to my Monday. <laughs> So, so yeah. that's actually, that's oh, actually my very first um, booking when I went out on my own. That's how it turned out. I, I did a COA and then they just crumbled. So I had to redo the entire thing mm -hmm. right. and I still needed it that weekend. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Nobody that's needs something. to sleep. It's, it's, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. It's also <laughs> something we don't like to, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Just one thing I just remember to add some of them. Um, do you get pores slightly slower because pad makers have started laminating the skins mm -hmm. together? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the only thing I'd add to that. Some will yep. take that's longer. <laughs> cool. And I think it depends on the climate and the environment and how yeah, much, it, uh, you know, like yeah. so many, so many other things too. Um, do you guys want to move on to the next question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. I can tell everybody's tired today. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I just finished two things. Like, uh, <laughs> but we're talking about pads, so this is very energizing. I love talking about pads. Oh, right. Yeah, pads are great to talk about. This <laughs> All right. Um, our next question, um, Leticia asks about reskinning pads. So, when can you reskin a pad without having to replace the whole pad, if ever? and what materials are needed and best to use, would you ever be willing to do an online demonstration of how to reskin a pad? So our order is going to be Adam again. <laughs> Sorry, Adam, you're always first. Rachel, <laughs> keeping them, Kim, and I'm always last, <laughs> and then me. <laughs> All right, um, Adam, go ahead. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of get on to one small thing you can do it and i'm just going to get on materials because that does matter um strawbinger pads tend to have what's called gold beater skin which is a cattle byproduct other pads like the sony s2s will have what most people call fish skin which is a sheep byproduct 
They're two very different skin materials, so it mm -hmm. is important to kind of know what kind of pad you're using and which of the two skins to use, um, because one is much tougher and they, they just handle very differently. Mm -hmm. cool. Yes, they do. Um, and uh, when choosing whether to rescan a pad or not, one of the things that I look at is um, the impression on the uh, micro suede. And, and I, I say micro suede because really the only pads that I ever consider reskinning are um, synthetic like, you know, mostly synthetic pads, like an S2 or a Straubinger. Um, but yeah, if, if you've got a pretty deep impression there, or if there's already been a tear and you've got a spot on it, I would th at that point just say replace it. But if it's otherwise pretty nice and maybe that the, the player just roughed up the edge with a polishing cloth, that might be a good candidate for um, reskinning. Perfect. Excellent timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other time when I'll reskin instead of replacing a pad is um, sometimes if it's in um, in a, an alignment group or in group like a regulation group where it's already got it's already compressed a little bit mm -hmm. so sometimes I'll do that if I know that the flute's going to need to be repadded or overhauled in the next year or two um, and I'm just trying to make it kind of survive but I don't want to put a brand new pad in a really good example of that would be the um, F sharp key um, and the either of the G keys, um, although I tend to just pull both of the G keys at one time and just like do them, um, just replace them. But yeah, reskinning, I do that with the F chart probably the most often, or if it's a totally bizarre size of pad that I don't have and it doesn't happen often because I, I have stock, but <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear the buzzer thingy. It's all good. <laughs> It's all good. It's all it's very good stuff. It was all very good stuff. There was, no, good stuff. There was okay. no buzzer. I, I, well, it did, and then I danced, and then oh, <laughs> if you see someone dancing, <laughs> it's okay. You can finish though. That okay? That was my time too. So go ahead. <laughs> go go. It's, okay. uh, well, all I was going to say is that like, um, <laughs> if you take the Strawbinger certification, they will show you how to reskin a pad, and they give you like Strawbinger actual like punched out, beautiful little authentic Strawbinger pad skins to use mm -hmm. and they give you the little kit and directions and it's all good fun. Um, uh, in terms of like doing an online demo at some point, I think I have a video on my Instagram doing it somewhere. It would also be a really good thing to do for the Patreon. That would be a great thing. Which, to do which is because we'll be doing, we'll be definitely doing more um, yes. demos and stuff yes. like that demos. in the Patreon then we will be here just because we gotta have some perks, right? <laughs> I, I'd love to do a pad reskinning yeah, video. Yeah. I think it's really fun yeah, to do. It is. And it's like art and crafts. It is. Yeah. It's, it's like Elmer's glue and it's like, yeah. it's, it's it's like we, had, we didn't talk about adhesives. Um, I use Elmer's glue. I know some people use mucilage. I mean, there are all kinds of things you can do. Um, it's really hard to get mucilage, mucilage in since like 1980. Five yep. though, so. <laughs> Incidentally, for, for those who don't know, that's the school glue that we all used when we were little in the little rubber nib container. Well, and Elmer's if is what uh, Strawberry uses anyway. Yeah. So yeah. if it's right. good enough yeah, for them, switched. it's good enough for me. Exactly. It also is nice and thin. Like the mucilage, I actually used, I don't know how we had it, but there is an ancient tube of mucilage and I oh. used it. But it, it um, after it dries, it changes a lot more. It shrinks mm -hmm. way down. And so, whereas the Elmer's, once it cures, it's more or less, you know, I mean, you have to adjust after it dries, but it's not yeah. nearly as. Uh, I just figured it didn't I, exist anymore. That's, I use that's the, the other reason. special order it. It's, it's really hard. You have to go to an art store. I use the clear stuff. I know some people use the yeah. white stuff, but I use the clear stuff because I find it's a little bit more flexible. Um, so it holds things a little bit better and it's, it, I, don't, I don't know, cool. your mileage I, just, I figured there was a store that had like really old school supplies. So you could get like one of those like purple, like min mimeograph machines and like mucilage. And, like, oh, that would be so <laughs> cool. Smell of those. It's like amazing. <laughs> the little four, the little four hole scissors. What? Wait, what? The little hand over hand scissors. <gasps> I remember those. Yeah. Okay. And you're sorry that there's like a way <laughs> off of not remember those. I'm sorry. Welcome, I, welcome to memory lane. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. The big fat pencils. I still buy those because I love them. I love those too. <laughs> yeah. 
Cool. All right. <laughs> so back to pad reskinning. So, so that's like reskinning pads. <laughs> um, so yeah, we should do a demo on the Patreon sometime. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, and there are other places like you can buy pad skins from like JL Smith and from Music Center, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah. They have Music Center has two different types. I'm I'm yes. pretty much I think everybody yeah. like all of the this major suppliers sell them. Balance. This is JL Smith. It doesn't have a hole in the middle and it's bigger. Um, yeah. and I don't know which animal product <laughs> this one is. That's that's like, the, I think that's fish. That's this, fish. Okay, so this is like the S2 stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, it is a little bit thinner, and it, it you know, it, it's yeah. just a different product. I think the Gold Beaters is a little bit tougher because they actually use that to make gold leaf. That's how it got the name Gold Beater Skin, but, you know. I, I, know, I, know, <laughs> I, I know that that Rachel actually disagrees on that, right? I, I, I do, but the, it's really not based in science. It's just like my, you know, what I've experienced here, like seeing things. Yeah. As, I just, as I, is most of the stuff that we do. Right. We product, it's debatable. You know, I just yeah. know that they, they hamper the crap out of that stuff to make gold leaf is all I know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So well, it's, there's different geometric the, pressures. Yeah. I good. think the other thing is that it depends how fresh, for lack of a better word, the skins are. If you're working with old skins and new skins, they're going to behave really differently. I, I have sheep in my backyard, so. <laughs> That's too fresh. If you're talking about a live sheep, step away from the sheep. Uh, also, the um, we're really going over. I'm so sorry, yeah, but so I have over. to say, sorry. I have to say that like the 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 um the gold sorry whatever the fish skin that I'm I'm used with use with the S twos is laminated, so that that's definitely a factor. And that, that too, sick. which yeah, yes. it's laminated. And, and so. the Straubinger's ones I've are also worked. laminated, so that's I've yeah, not okay. yeah they are. Yep. Yeah, I've not worked with the laminated fish skin, so that that's, that's probably good to the know. Good so it's good to experiment. Yeah. Try try different things and see what works best for you. <laughs> cool. Okay. Now we're really um, yay. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, really are. Okay. Um, <laughs> Christina. Okay, Christina asks. Um, you talked before about, oh gosh, we have to remember something that we said in a previous episode. No. <laughs> you you no. talked before about making sure that your food skills are very good before taking any of the Straubinger or other courses like that. Hmm. What kinds of resources would you recommend for someone trying to get to that level and how do you know when you're ready? Okay, so for this, we're going to go with Kim, Rachel, <laughs> me, and then Adam. Um, in 30 seconds. Um, I think <laughs> one of the things would be, make sure you've read this book. Uh, it's sort of, it, it's a little bit outdated in some respects, but it's still really, really solid. And it will walk you through the things. So if you're comfortable with all the terminology and the skill sets in here, um, then I think you're definitely sort of ready to do that. You need to be really strong on key fitting. That is going to be the the biggest thing before you go, you need to be really strong on being able to fit keys without damaging keys. Um, that's mine. This is a hard question. The reason that this is hard for me to answer is because it kind of goes into the, how do I get a job fixing flutes topic, which is just hard mm -hmm. to say. Um, because in general, I would say before you're ready to do strobbing or any other kind of certification, you need to have at least if I was to pick a number, like a year or two in the field doing either an apprenticeship or a, um, you know, a, a straight up repair job uh, in order to eat it, A, be qualified and B, get the most out of it too. Um, cause otherwise you're going to wish you had taken it a year later, you know, um, once you get some more mileage. Yes. Um, um, okay. So I would say if you can hook up with another flute technician and show them some of your work, that's probably going to be the most telling. The other thing is uh, your feeler gauge technique needs to be really excellent. Like you need to know how to push a key and close it without using pressure because flute players are picky and the flute can, you, you cannot be using pressure to, to close your keys. So if you're used to um, working on other woodwinds that can be more forgiving of that, you have to lighten up a lot. So they have to hold it sideways, you know, right. we're not like right out in front gripping it. Yeah. Right. Cool. Adam? 
Um, just to kind of expand on, aside from all of that, the key fitting thing, that is a really, really important skill. Um, and if you know anybody that graduated from Red Wing, they have a lot of chapters in their textbook, and it's this gigantic, like, three-ring mm -hmm. binder just for woodwinds. And then they have another one for brass and then another one for lathes, um, which someone borrowed mine, and he now works at Haynes. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you can get your, um, if you can get your hands on that book and just start reading and, you know, just start, like, there are lots of forums where you can just go back and look through old posts and you can find a lot of information about key fitting that way. Um, I would, I, I think I probably, of the four of us, went into the Strawbanger class with the least experience. Um, and... I was working till two in the morning a lot of the nights um, because that was very, very early <laughs> in my, my flute, my, my focusing only on flutes. And I was still a full-time band director at the time and was trying to make the transition into being a full-time flute tech. And I knew that having that certification was going to be the thing that would make people more likely to trust me um, with their fancy flutes. So um, that's actually where Adam and I met. <laughs> <laughs> we sat across the table from each other. <laughs> um, and so it was, and I also had brought a flute that I had to replace every single spud in. And I had never done that before. Mm -hmm. So that set me back by about a day because I had, like, now it takes me, you know, like 20 minutes. But at that point, I had just literally never done anything like that. That's so not uh, fair. Yeah, I Adam finished, like, halfway through the first day. And he's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was finished before lunch on the second day and then I had like two days left and David was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, let's make a flute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So even though like, um, I, I felt, I, I was a little nervous going in. Um, I'm very glad that I did it when I did it. It ended up working out just fine. I passed. It was fine. Um, but and the person who I brought their flute, I talked to her like all the time. She's still totally thrilled with it. So, <laughs> phew. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I would say make sure that you it, bring some of your flutes to somebody else who is already cert dropping or certified or already works on a lot of fancy flutes and they'll be probably the best person to, to gauge whether you're, you're ready or not, if that's possible. Anybody want to? The other thing I'd like to add, I, I, I worked on flutes for a really long time before I got certified. So it's not something that you need to feel like you, after two years, have to go and do this. Um, the other piece of advice I would have is that I would go once you know that that's something you want to be doing all the time because it is a skill set that you need to be able to maintain. So mm -hmm. if you think, if you're going and you think you may get like, sorry, like it's one, like, a, like if you think that you're only gonna, gonna have the potential to do one a year because there's five other techs in your area that have been doing this for ages, um, it may or may not be something you wanna rush into right away. There might be other options that you wanna explore because it definitely is a skill set that you need to do all the time to remain good at. Um, and I'd hate for somebody to, to go and then not get their money's worth because they, they're only doing like one flute a year and then they kind of go, I don't even remember how I'm doing it because that can be kind of dangerous, actually. Yeah. You can that, make interesting mistakes. Yeah. That being said, I think um, there are a lot of transferable skills from that yeah. class that you will apply to every flute that you do regardless because it's a lot of foundational Absolutely. concepts of just yeah. good flute work. Um, and it's not really yeah. much about the pads at all. <laughs> <laughs> the pads are the easy part. Yeah. Really. The pads, the pads are the easy is. part. It's an intensive padding theory course is really yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's how to work relative to tone holes and key cups. And it's invaluable knowledge. Even if you don't use Straubinger pads very often, you'll use that information yeah. across the spectrum, regardless of whether it's a clarinet or an oboe or a saxophone. We're going to use those skills. Cool. Moving on. I would I would yeah. say call them and talk to them. Yeah. Just because because that's going to be actually the best way to gauge it is to call and talk to them and explain where you are where you are and where you want to be, mm -hmm. and then get feedback directly from them because it really is a very personal thing about are you ready or should you maybe put some more time in getting some other skills polished up so that you can get the most of that week because it goes by so fast. 
and they are very used to answering this question. Yeah, so yeah. yes, <laughs> they're good and they're folks to talk to. Too. They're very approachable. So that's, yeah. that's something that I really like about them. They're easy to talk to. Yes, mm -hmm. agreed. Shall we go on? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, let's do it. Um, we're actually doing fine on time, so we can ramble. So oh, good. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Ron says, I'm a retired tech and an amateur player. Very much enjoying your presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did we mention we have a Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> patreon.com slash flute tech talk <laughs> um anyway um sorry <laughs> okay we're wondering what you, what thoughts you may have had uh with regard to the idea of floating in flute pads as we do with sax pads i hadn't heard of it until recent discussions on flute forum but it did strike me as an idea that might have some merit i must say i don't miss shimming <laughs> <laughs> We feel you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for this, we're going to go with Adam, Rachel, moi, and Kimberly. Um, I will say that I have seen one gold Muramatsu that someone had floated in Straubinger pads. Gold beer. Uh, yeah, and I. No matter We're sorry what, to both Muramatsu and Straubinger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my and, gosh. And like. Wait, floated I, in Straubinger pads? Yeah, they floated it in, and I, or they gl super glued it in, or they did something, and I could not get them to budge, and I said, you know what? I'm gonna have to overhaul this. I I don't know what else to do, and if I even try to pull this out, it's going to tear. And so I said, at least it's a repad or, you know, an overhaul, and they never came back. <laughs> wow. All right. Rachel. Sad story. Okay. Um, well, anyone who's sh shimmed high-end flutes and we're, you know, dealing with half thousands tolerances at least, um, it's impossible to envision that being practical, just simply floating especially for that diameter of a tone hole. Um, that said, even though I just said all that, um, the Yamaha bass flutes, I call them the saxophone mm -hmm. flute because they, they do use leather floated pads with resonators. It's so cute. I love them. Um, but I, they turn out fine. I mean, really, I float them like a big, you know, or rather a small saxophone and they, they do work. But um, yeah, in general, I would say not advisable. Wow, I have I have yet to see one of those now. I'm curious. <laughs> they're pretty. I cool. love them. They're That's working. Cool. They're they're really. Neat. Um, I think Rachel, your comment about, I think, it, yeah, I think it, it it's that half thousandth thing and the fact that flute players don't squeeze. Like you just can't ever. I mean, sometimes I'll like, I'll play a flute and I'll go like, mm, this isn't, mm, 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 nope. And I'll put a half thousandth thim shim from like four to six at the front of the E and the whole flute just like wakes up. And I can't envision doing that with a flute. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I used to do a lot of saxophones and clarinets and stuff like that as well. So I, so I, I, I empathize about wishing we could float them. I think the other issue is that we have weather constraints and flutes tend to change with the weather. So we need to be able to shim them and adjust them um, for humidity and stuff like that. The reason the sax, the, the reason the saxophone pads work in the, in the bass clarinet, sorry, now you've got me on there, um, is because they're leather. So it's by nature a softer material and it's got more give and it sort of works kind of like a saxophone. Um, but yeah, it, it they just need too fine of adjustment and there's no way you'd be able to, to even with suction, get it close enough. Yeah. So I can hear people thinking to themselves, well, then why not just use a softer pad on the flutes? You know, a soft leather pad, float it in on flutes. It'll be nice and smushy. Squish. It'll, Squish. it'll totally work. <laughs> <laughs> it won't really That's work what because, we want. Because you Squishy. can't play Cardinal of the Animals on something that's squishy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have one client whose touch is so light 
that with a half thousand sealer and with checking with a light, it's sealing all the way around. You eventually realize as a technician from the spud to the outside of the pad, that's a triangular relationship. And with her instrument, I also have to take um, a double-edged razor blade, curve it to match the, the shim and cut out the tiniest little ribbons and put them around the outside mm -hmm. of it because she can feel it. And it's the wildest yep. thing. Her COAs take me like four days, but you know, she can feel it. And that's just what I have to do. So yep. some players are super light. So that's why I just don't think it's advisable. And then the one that I did see that was floated in, they were all leaking in the back. So the glue tends mm -hmm. to shrink mm -hmm. as, it, as it cools. So then you end up having to pad them heavy in the back and then they're leaking the front and then you end up with the player squeezing again anyway and they're, it's just not gonna work. So. We're sorry, we wish it worked too. <laughs> yeah, I thought about, about trying one and then just expecting to scrap, you know, a lot of pads trying it. And then I just was like, you know what? I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. I can't do it, so. It's the same reason the um, glue in washers that were sort of a fad very briefly have run away. Um, thankfully, they're still available sort of <laughs> from some places, but they, they like, I don't even think it's on the like the order list anymore. You have to kind of like ask specifically. Um, but the, it's the same reason why those didn't work. It's because heating them up and like they were called bedding washers and they just, <sighs> They just don't work for flutes, unfortunately. It was a great idea. It just, it, the flutes are different. So They're sorry. Okay. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. We're all yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Can you tell it's been a heavy shimming week for all of us? <laughs> We're so That's sorry. why I'm a little more subdued right now. I've really <laughs> used a lot of brain power for, for padding this week. I love it. Yeah. It's my favorite thing, but I want to clarify is. though, too, like when we say that we spend a ton of time shimming, that doesn't mean we're putting in a lot of shims. No, yes. no, which I think people have yes. this, 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 um, uh, kind of like, oh, well, if they're using all those pencils, <sighs> they're, they like, their flutes must look like confetti. <laughs> like, no, because yeah, no. a lot of it is actually not putting in a lot of shims, but figuring out where the right shims should go. And so something mm -hmm. that's like, yeah, okay, that's not a one. Okay, uh, the half doesn't really do it. So let me see if I can like do a little step thing. Okay, that's a little bit better now, it, like, right? So it's, a lot of my shimming is actually taking out partials. Yeah. And right. So, it, yeah. Yeah, well, one thing just to, so you can have a visual of what I'm talking about is if you have an Instagram, not to like plug my Instagram, but I post a I lot of pictures. I, I pub, I, pug. I have a pug and she's snoring. Um, anyway, I post a lot of pictures of what the insides of my pad cups look like so people can see how things I think should be shimmed. And that takes a long time because I like to have very few partials. Now at the end of the day, sometimes it's just like whatever it takes to make it happen because at some point we have to go to sleep. But, you know, if I can, I try to keep like one partial or two partials or ideally none. Mm -hmm. um, and that can just take a long time because it's constantly adjusting protrusion and it's constantly like, well, I guess it's tilted just a quarter of a step this way or this way. Mm -hmm. And so you're constantly going back and forth and playing this dance. So it's not about lots of shims. It's about the right shims. Yes. I, yes. I'd, like to, I'd like to think that my, my math teachers are proud of me because although I'm really horrible at math, like on paper and pencil, I have a, a geometry, I, I call it intuitive geometry, where we have to like figure out those shims and the angles and stuff like that. And I, I think that there's something to be said for being able to do geometry in your head to a half bow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's, it's actually pretty amazing when you think about it. Sometimes we, it's so normal to us that we forget how fine those adjustments are. But yeah, we all, we all do a half bow and sometimes we get angry that we don't have something thinner. <laughs> yeah. I have yeah. before, I don't recommend it. One star. 
Wait, what? Yeah, I miss that. Gold leaf. I've I've tried that. No, it doesn't. I don't yeah. recommend it. One star. One star. <laughs> 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 Have you, yeah, have you? I'm really yeah. good at geometry. So when I use my feeler and double check with the light, because feelers lie, they always lie, and so do lights. Mm -hmm. They all lie. Everything so lies. Does the mag. Everything lies. Yeah. Everything lies. So I've just gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, well, I know it is leaking from here to here. So it means, okay, well, that means I need to tip the cup very slightly one way and then increase it exactly two thousandths. But it's because mm -hmm. I was really good at geometry and I figured out that math. Yeah. There, I have very few absolutes with this work because I think that's that's just a recipe for disaster. But one of those oh, yeah. absolutes is I would say that you cannot pad a flute unless you can imagine what the pad is doing. Mm -hmm. I can't see any other way of it. You ha it's an imaginative exercise because you can't actually see. You have to read the results you're getting and compare it with what you did and imagine what's going on in there. And that helps you predict what your next step will, will accomplish. Um, it's, yeah. And my my... First flute professor, Sandy Seafeld, she said, um, true artistry is the simplification of the complex. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like to apply that to padding, which I know she wasn't thinking about flute pads at that time. <laughs> but, but that's so true. And like what Adam said, just because you see two shims in a cup, it doesn't mean it took less time. It usually means it took more time. I, 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 yeah. Most of the time when I see confetti, I feel like some, that's a lot more slapdash than someone that took the time to figure out exactly where two shims need to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's I and mean, we can talk about shimming pads for weeks. we can. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about it for years in private. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys want to leave it for today and go on to the yeah. next? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. said There's we could so ramble, so I yeah. You know, I don't know what time is it? Oh, we got time. We're good. All right. Uh, ish. Okay. So, uh, Will Will asks us. Have you any strong opinions on polishing and the general handling of silver? Is instant tarnish remover a no-no for handmade flutes? How do you feel about the boiling water plus baking soda plus aluminum foil method for tarnish <laughs> removal? Who's going to laugh with me on this one? <laughs> Adam. And then Kim. And then Rachel. Oh, I guess I don't need to shake that. It's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adam, take it away. <laughs> okay, for me, nine times out of 10, I'm going to use a silver dip that typically has like a sulfuric acid base to it. Um, but if I'm working on something that's really old and I'm concerned about the plating, I will also do, I'll boil the flute in that way. Not like actually boil the flute, but I'll do the hot, <laughs> the hot water with the baking soda. Pasta in one pot, flute in the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't do that. I'm just, I'm just concerned about the plating. So, but if it's solid, I'll I'll dip it. Cool. Uh, Kim. Um, we're all laughing because I I've had this horrible fear of the aluminum foil and baking soda trick, and it's because of some totally random weird memory twenty years ago. Um, <laughs> it, it, um, so I'm sort of a convert. I will do the tarnish dips rarely, but I actually now prefer doing the aluminum foil and baking soda trick. Uh, the caveat would be that if you've got something that has questionable plating, um, I maybe don't. Um, we'll talk yeah. more about it later. Oh, my 30 seconds are up. <laughs> Am I next or are you next, Sarah? You're next. Okay, so when it comes to tarnish removal, my, my two priorities are in order preserving silver and preserving my hands. The, those, are, those are my two top considerations. And so um, what I've found preserves both of those the best is um, the baking soda and aluminum foil followed with um, Haggerty's liquid silver polish mm -hmm. and, and a microfiber. And that will get a whole lot. It'll get all of it in light tarnish cases, and if it's really embedded, um, it'll still get most of it. Cool. Um, I also use the, bake, uh, the baking soda and tinfoil trick. However, I learned <laughs> a few weeks ago that you need to check the kind of aluminum foil that you buy, because if you buy the non-stick kind, it does not work, and it makes your flute a little slimy. So <laughs> not only does it not remove the tarnish, but it, uh, it was bad. Um, it came off fine. It cleaned up fine, but that it did not remove tarnish, and I couldn't understand why until I looked at the box and went, 
Oh, I would never what? have thought of that. It's like I by sheer chance that that has not happened to me. I didn't even know that it was a thing. Um, I did not know. Yeah, but Rachel converted me to Haggerty's, so I use that a lot. Um, and most I, of the time, I do too. have I do have the pink the Empire stuff. Mm-hmm. I tend to not use it very much unless a flute has like like the cooked on like terrible looking like like <laughs> ceramic tarnish <laughs> exactly um and even that doesn't touch it so usually i'll end up doing that plus you know three other things to you know get that off um right since i'm in atlanta and it's really humid here flutes have a tendency to really tarnish mm-hmm. so like the I, the baking soda trick for me it just takes an un- ungodly amount of time to do it mm-hmm. Whereas if I monitor like my pH balance of, I typically dilute my solution is what I do. I'll take one container of the the tarnish dip that I'm using and then I fill that, I pour that in a tray and then I fill it up with water and then I put it, so it's 50-50. And then I I can leave it in there for a few minutes without worrying um, because I know it's not super aggressive. Anybody wanna add anything else? Oh, one of the other things that I like about the the aluminum foil and baking soda trick, thanks guys, I appreciate <laughs> everybody. Everybody had to convince me that it was okay. I don't know. It, did. It, we were like 10 was, minutes of chatting like, Kim, no, really, it's okay. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> it's, it's a good example though of how things that you learn in the past you can hang on to for, a log- for illogical reasons. And I hung on to it because I had this piece of information that wasn't actually true in my head. Um, so it, it is a really, really good example of why sometimes you just have to kind of work with stuff is one of the other things I like, I had a really um, serious case of t- um, tarnish remediation from a case problem this week. And one of the things that's nice about the, the hot water and the aluminum is it tends to do a really good job of loosening that stuff. It doesn't necessarily yes. take it off. So you can't actually see it coming off when it's in the, the whatever vessel you're using. Um, but it does come off a much easier if you like right away, take it over and do Haggerty's or, or Mm -hmm. whatever you're going to use. Um, so that's, that's the other thing about that, that I really, that I really like. It helps your hands. Let me really briefly just tell everybody what this method is, just in case there are people who are going to be talking about. Um, (laughs) So basically you want to take a a Tupperware that will fit whatever is that you're trying to remove tarnish from. Line it with regular tin foil <laughs> or aluminum foil. <laughs> I know Not they're the nerdy stuff. Kind. Um, put the silver in there, so whatever. It, again, and try to make it contact the aluminum as much as you can, because basically you're you're mm-hmm. creating like um. A it's chemical. electrolysis. It, it's electrolysis. Yeah. So you want contact between the metal parts. Um, and then I, if you can do this in either order. I've done it both ways. You can either sprinkle, sprinkle like a good amount, a dusting of baking soda over the top and then pour like boiling water in on it or put the water in and then sprinkle. I don't think it matters the order unless one of you guys has. I haven't I do both. I put, I go, put the baking soda in first and then like <laughs> put the flute in, put the, the baking soda in and the water and then I add more. There you go. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes it's just fun to keep adding it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. Basically, the, the reaction that's <laughs> happening is that the it, it's creating a reaction where it pulls the sur- the sulfur compound off of the flute and it plates it onto the aluminum. So you're mm-hmm. basically, you're leaving all of the silver on the flute, which is why it's one of the safest ways to remove tarnish because it's actually not removing any silver at all. It's just removing the sulfur and sticking it to the aluminum foil. I've also heard it called a museum dip, which I think yes, like no. aptly describes, you know, it's like to preserve delicate pieces like that. Like, I don't know, Paul Revere's pictures or whatever. And they probably boil Paul Revere's pictures on occasion. Um, <laughs> and just to, just to like, Did he you, make this, pictures? This, we, this is done when there are no corks felt. <laughs> like, oh yeah, because they will leave. They'll be gone. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I try to see if the trill corks will stay, but for the most part, they're floating around at the end. And so yeah. it's just, it's part of an overhaul. I actually, I actually put them in because then they tend to come off really easy. There you go. Oh, hey. So, so I toss them in because they're going to float away and float away sounds way easier to me than, you know, taking them off the old fashioned way. It's true. Oh, for the so. water temperature, um, I use like a hot. Oh, what? no, sorry. What happened? I was 3D printing a spider. <laughs> it just collapsed. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> technician problems. Uh, well, that's okay. I'll, um, Clean up on aisle 3D printer. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say for the water temperature, if you're wondering, oh, th what happened? Oh. Hold on. Is there, is there string everywhere? Do you have string all over the place? No, I just like for some reason, it, the nozzle went lower than the model and it just started to like oh. bash into the... Oh, I know. Are you good now? <laughs> it's like... Well, that was exciting. Oh, that is very sad. Yeah, yeah it's... we. Yeah, that's... That's well, nothing. That's... <laughs> oh, that's violent. Yeah, wow. that was... It's abstract art. We can sell it. I wonder what the artist is trying to say with this piece. <laughs> it's been I'm a long so... week. Oh, Corin, I apologize. <laughs> Your little monster coolio action guy is <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I add one more thing? Yes. About cleaning and polishing and stuff. <laughs> no, Sorry. No. Um, the other thing is that we talked about like polishing. Um, so I don't machine polish much here, and it's because uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. However, um, in the the location that I'm in. Uh, a lot of the flutes that I get have been pretty heavily polished in the past. Um, the sharp stuff's round now. Um, and there's so, no logos on anything. And there's, <laughs> there's no logos. Um, so because I know that um, things in this area have in the past ended up being polished fairly heavily, I tend to encourage my clients very strongly to do little, if any, polishing um, because honestly, I don't know how much metal's left, uh, especially if it's a silver plated instrument. If it's a, a solid instrument, it's a little bit different, but still they paid for all of the silver. They should keep it. Um, <laughs> but especially for silver plate um, and especially for any of the Japanese manufacturers where they plate over the solid silver, it's not the same color under there. No. I can um, so that. it is really important <laughs> that you're um, overly <laughs> cautious about that. Yes. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to just add is that that sometimes, uh, oftentimes, less is more when it comes to polishing. Yes. And, and let what? me just clarify that I learned that the hard way on my own flute. So <laughs> <laughs> my own flute, I can look at it and go, oh yeah, yeah, that's where I hit it too hard with the buffer. And then after that, I, I learned. And that was the first time I ever buffed anything and close to the last time I ever buffed anything. Oh. Um. A couple of like really quick like small tips if you're needing to like do very gentle polishing and you don't quite know what to do. Um, I mean you can use like like this is like silver polish cloth and I buy this by the yard and if people ask I'm happy yeah. to like links to it because this is actually the same brand of stuff that they use for the White House silver so it's really high quality stuff. Paul Revere's um, pictures. So I, yeah, <laughs> all that. Anyway um, <laughs> You can actually, I mean, first of all, you can load it up with red buffing compound, but if you gently heat the red buffing compound, you can dissolve it with valve oil. So you get what a I liquid have. red rouge, and that gets into like all the crevices really carefully. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then I have, I, it's like a slurry. Um, yeah, it's like a yeah. slurry, and it, it's really nice if you need to be very careful, like on a plated finish, and you just want to rag mm -hmm. it by hand. That's a really clever way to get in there without using something a bit more aggressive. And please um, never buff with the keys on, ever. No, the flute, don't ever. I spent please hours don't. cleaning rouge out of a flute this week. Or with the pads in. Please don't do that either. Well, no, um, mine is so liquid that I just literally like you just yeah. dip it in, and it's it's um, it's way less than paste. It's it, it, it's, it's literally liquid. just yeah. It's yeah. It does tend to separate, so you do have to kind of like shake it and stir it up because it will the the par particulates will like settle to the bottom. But it's just a really nice little trick. So and it rinses off with um, regular like soap and water really well. So that's another thing is you don't have to use any kind of um, chemical degreasers. Um, for that, I use valve oil as well because it's um, less aromatic than kerosene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We have just a couple minutes left. Do we want to keep going? Oh my gosh, if it's fine. Okay. One more question. Yeah, yeah. My goodness. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do the next one because it's, yeah. The next the one. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I like whatever one. one you want. All right, let's do it. That's probably the shorter one. That's why I was at the last. It's one. way more fun. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> this is. I know this is like Rachel's jam right here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reaching off camera. So the question stuff. is, um, Bob asks, "What is your favorite sheet material for flute kickers?" Um, and we're gonna go with Rachel because Rachel. <laughs> 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 and then uh, Adam, and then me, and then Kim. All right, Rachel, take it away. Well, my, my biggest personal, like, I guess you could even call it a peeve. It's peeve level. I love to match. And matching is also what's, what's there right now. And also, what if I'm overhauling, I like to think what the manufacturer would have put on. Um, in some cases, I feel like I would differ with the manufacturer on what kicker would have been there. But even if I do, I try to pick the same color. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a whole rainbow of, of kicker materials that I use um, to, to, you know, satisfy my OCD, basically. And um, suit the player too. <laughs> they have different properties. Cool. Uh, Kim. I have a whole bucket. Um, <laughs> oh, you do? I, I do. I have literally, it's an entire bucket of, of that and um, bulk flute plugs because they have to go somewhere. I too tend to match what the manufacturer does. Um, we're big fans of felt here uh, as well, but I tend to try to match what the manufacturer is. Um, unless it poses a, a problem with a specific client. Um, if they play really, really hard or really, really light, then I'll accommodate. I don't like things that compress really fast and go out of adjustment, even if they're quieter. Because, yeah. yeah. Okay. There. Um, not cork. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, please, not cork. <laughs> not cork. I used to, I, I, I think I was... I think I learned to do cork like way in the beginning because they think that's those, like the traditional thing or uh, something. It's I on know. student flutes. It's, it's their so, own student flutes. But stuff. even not anymore. It's, it's just so, so loud. loud. It's so loud. Um, to the point where when people come in with with cork kickers, um, I'll, I'll offer to just change it over, and afterward they're like, I can't. I leave. I have one right oh, now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's it's really so. Don't in general cork not for flutes. Yes, for pickles, not for flutes. Adam. Um, so piccolos, I'll use cork on a lot of the feet. Um, for felt, I actually, because um, Sarah and I kind of went in and bought one of these and then we cut it in half, but <laughs> you can get the di there are different kinds of felt out there. Most people buy wool felt sheets, but it's not nearly the same quality as rabbit fur felt. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. We've all probably we just it's, like, sort of a, it's sort of, it ended up being a team effort. I have to find part of a hat too. I'm not yeah. going to find my, but I have some. <laughs> but anyway, like one trick that I want to show that I figured out was you can also like on the big cork kickers underneath like the trills in E flat, mm -hmm. you can also take um, ultra suede and you can laminate it to the bottom. Um, yeah. So this is actually like on my personal flute. So, you know, it's not seen work in five years, but um, <laughs> it holds up really well. And it's really, really quiet if you can laminate that. But the way you have to do it is you have to over sand the thickness. So mm -hmm. that way the venting mm -hmm. is way too big and you have to constantly like put the sheet yes. under there and then measure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's time consuming. Yeah, if you do that and then you use a, a double edged razor to razor it off, then you can take a lighter and you can just singe the edges really quick, it comes out super clean. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also what I do with sanding in the, the feet felt. I'll leave them oversized, then I'll razor them, and then I, I singe them really quick. Yeah, um, and it's so. often, um, because we don't want it compressing, so we want something that's really quiet, but not, um, not fluffy, right? So a yeah. lot of times, like I will, uh, with with that hat that everybody was holding up, so when, <laughs> when I got it, it was actually pretty flexible. So um, and Rachel's the one who turned us on to this, so thank you, Rachel. It's a beautiful hat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so basically, I take a spray bottle, I wet the, I, you know, I cut out the, you know, a small, not like the whole hat, like <laughs> so I do this, I saturate yeah. the spray bottle, and then I just hit it with the hottest setting on my iron. Like I mean, not like this, but like you know. Uh, spray it uh, until yeah. it literally like doesn't bend when I'm done doing that yeah. um, but it's yeah. still super quiet so it's like compressed as much as it's ever going to compress it's super quiet it's you know authentic to what Boston flute makers have been using forever um, mm -hmm. 
and yeah, it, but in terms of like student flutes, I like the the gray stuff from JL Smith. Um, that's the charcoal stuff. Yeah, like the, the, the synthetic the, um, felt. Yeah, synthetic yeah. Felt. This yeah stuff, I, that stuff. I, yep. I drawer of like different kinds of cork yep. and felt and yeah. all of that. Another little trick is after you do the, the steaming and the ironing and, you know, you burn yourself a couple times and, you know, all of that. One thing that I have figured out that helps it stick and adhere well is to take whatever contact cement you use and thin it down. So like my concept yeah. is the weld wood and you can thin that down with either like toluene or xylene. And I will pre, you can see it here. Mm -hmm. I have pre-coated it here and that seals the back. I only do like one coat because I'm a super glue person. Um, but you know, some people use shellac, you know, that they heat and they boil it and they just clamp it. And then there are people that use contact cement, you know, whatever suits your fancy. But if you go in and thin the contact cement just a little bit, it seals the back and it makes it really easy to glue. Yep. Mm. Cool. Um, we're, we're actually over time, guys. <laughs> I know. Okay. Right? We, I, I feel like we finally like woke up a little bit. <laughs> so um, anyway, thank you to everybody who tuned in. It's just, you know, I, the yeah, fact that we've done six of these now, it's pretty great. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll be back uh, next week with actually another tech edition because we have so many tech questions to answer. Yay. So, uh, join us again, send us more questions. Uh, players, if there's any players watching, I hope you are please send us more player questions because we love to do another player episode soon. Um, we actually yeah. ran out of player questions, um, but we have plenty that we think you would want to ask if you knew. So we can always riff. <laughs> um, so anyway, one more plug for the Patreon. Join us on there because then we can actually talk to you. Uh, it's just $10 a month and you know you can spend time with us, talk with us, banter live um, in a more uh, private setting. It will be fabulous. Uh, I promise. <laughs> and we and will more. <laughs> that if there are people in various places around the world who I know, like right now, this is a super inconvenient time for people in Europe. If you're in Europe and you want to join us, we will adjust the time so it's not two in the morning for you. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I think that's it. So we'll uh, we'll see you guys next week. And uh, thanks for tuning in.